Good morning, everybody. I bring greetings to you all from Malawi, the warm heart of Africa. Bwana Yesu asifiwe. Let me first of all give thanks to God as made it possible for me to join you this time. Last year, I longed to be with you, but uh, due to COVID restrictions, I couldn't make it even though I was only five hours away to be here in Gulu, I was in Kampala, but I had to fly back home because of the lockdown restriction. But God has made it possible that uh, we could be together this time around. And uh, I just want, if you may help me, just give a big hand to God for that. Um, and secondly, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Eternal Church but also uh, Union Community Church with my brother, Pastor Jimmy, and your staff for extending invitation that I could be part of the teaching team during this uh, Shepherd the Flock conference. And I do not take that for granted. There are many preachers who probably could have invited, but uh, you thought it wise that I could be part of the men uh, speaking on this conference, and I said thank you so much for the invitation. Would you please attain with me to the book of 1 Timothy chapter number four? That's where we'll be looking at what does it mean to preach Christ-centered message versus a man-centered message? In other words, what is the difference between the gospel-centered preaching with man-centered preaching. You would agree with me that there are many pastors out there, many churches out there, people are preaching day and night. But the bigger question that we must be asking ourselves is what sort of message is being preached? And that's what we'll be looking at. I'll be unpacking from this book of 1 Timothy chapter number 4, from verse number 1 to verse number 16. I commence reading. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some would depart from the faith by devoting themselves to a deceitful spirit and to teachings of demons. Through the insincerity of their lies, whose conscience are sealed, who forbid marriages and requires abstinence from food that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of faith and of good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irrelevant, silly mirth. Rather, train yourself for godliness, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promises for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. To this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to public reading of scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, for which I've given you by prophecy, when council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things, immerse yourself in them, so that all may see your progress. Keep close and watch on yourself and on the teaching Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. 
Friends, glass withers and the flower fades. But the word of living God shall live forever. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, we are so grateful this morning that it has pleased you that all of us, we can be here. We can worship you in languages, in words that we can't even understand sometimes. For great is you, Lord. Ye have given us a taste of what heaven will look like when men and women of all race from different corners of the world will be worshipping you day and night. You have said in your way that a man shall not leave a bread alone, but by every way that proceeds from your, from your mouth. God, I stand here as your servant, and I want to pray that, Lord, as these men and women are here, may they see you through me. May they hear your word through my mouth. May you speak to us. May you admonish us. May you equip us with your word, O oh God. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. A couple of years ago, the former president of South Africa, he had invited bishops, apostles, pastors, reverends, you name it. He invited them to have like a meal together. And he made a statement that up to now it still ringers in my mind. He said to these men and women of God who gathered with him, he said, he said, when I was growing up, there were few churches within South Africa. But as I'm growing older, I see churches almost every 10 to 5 kilometers, you see a church. You see men and women of God. You see great men with great titles. And the more churches are being planted and the more pastors are being ordained. And then he said, the more I see sin growing among us. And then he went on to say, he said, what has gone wrong? And this is a pure politician. And that's why as we continue today on this conference of shepherding the flock, it is very fitting for us as men and women of God to look into this issue of gospel centrality. What has happened that the preaching does not produce the results that it's supposed to be? Why is it that moral is still decaying among ourselves? even though we have got these churches. What has gone wrong? We have got men that when they preach, men would say amen and amen and amen and amen, but people go home without transformation. There is great need for us as men of God to preach nothing but the pure gospel. It is the gospel that will change and transform. If marriages are to be built in such a way, it all begins by preaching Christ and the Christ alone. And that's why when they asked me to say, we want you to talk about gospel centrality versus man-centered preaching, I was like, yes, this is important for us to remind one another. You can be a pastor, you can be a bishop, whatever title that God has given you, or maybe man has, has, has called you, and yet if you and I, we do not preach Christ, it is useless and it is meaningless. It will never produce any fruit. We are living in a time where the gospel is hard to find. We have got Bibles in our hands, we have got Bibles in our phones, we have got all these things in our churches, and yet people's lives are not changing. There's no transformation. I come from a country, they claim that 80% are Christians. And then you tend to wonder, corruption is still lampant. Most of these people who work in government or other agencies, on Sunday, they go to churches. Why is it that men are still living as if God doesn't matter in their lives? 
Paul, he had that agency, and he's writing in this epistle trying to warn this young pastor by the name of Timothy. He warned Timothy as he preaches that he should serve God to preach nothing but the sound doctrine. Doctrine that will point people to God and not doctrine that point people to themselves. Because he came to understand that man-centered preaching will never produce any fruit, will never bring transformation that we ought to have. It is only the gospel of Jesus Christ as we call people to Christ, the one who died for them and show them how God loves them and all God needs is us to have faith in him and in him alone. Now, as we come to this passage, I want us to look into two things. Number one, from verse number one to verse number five, I want us to look into what I have I've called like a man-centered message. A man-centered preaching. How does a man-centered message look like? From verse number one to verse number five, you see that Paul is unpacking that. He says, now the Spirit expresses, says, that in latter times, some would depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons. Every person who preaches, but what he preaches is not in the faith or in the word of God, that is what we call a man-centered message. Some of you are not getting. Every preaching that you and I, it's not just that you stand up and then you preach, but anything that we preach, which is not grounded in the word of God, it becomes what? Man-centered message. Sometimes here in Africa, we think if somebody is screaming, if somebody is, is, is having that angelic voice, hallelujah, hallelujah, oh God is speaking, oh my mama shakarababa sokorovakia, we think that's what is going to change. And Paul says, no, those are the teachings of demons. It doesn't bring transformation in people's life. It will never bring people closer to God. It's not how much you're shouting. It's not how much soft you are speaking. It's not how much you dance or how much you sing. It is by preaching Christ and the Christ alone. So he says that in the latter days, well, people have debated to say, what does it mean to, pay, to say latter days in the last days? Well, we have been in the last days since Christ ascended back to heaven. If you didn't know that we are in the latter times, we are in the last days. Since Christ returned back to God the Father, that was the beginning of the latter times, and we are in that days. It says in the latter times, people would depart from the faith. Mark those words, people would depart from the faith. He does not say people will, for, will, will completely forget about the church. No, they will still be in the church. They will still be having titles of bishop, apostle. You know, we are, I'm coming from a country, somebody called himself, he says he's a, he's a senior, and he says he's a major, major prophet, whatever. People have given themselves names. Names that maybe if you just say, oh my goodness, this is a man of God. And even when they introduce, they don't even introduce as Jimmy has said there, they will be like, oh, today we are having a man of God, a man who God has used, and the title, bigger titles. And yet if these men are not teaching the things of God, the Bible says what they are teaching, these are the teachings of demons. The, the sad part of it that I see from time to time, people do not look at it in that way. People, they would still call themselves as a church. And people would still call these men and women to say, these are great men of God. But then you say, what are you teaching? What are you preaching? Most of the times they're preaching things, it will be about material. 
I was asking this lady this other time, I'm like, what good does it do if a man of God comes to you and he says, I see, I see someone, someone in a paper a dress. Your, your name, your name, your name begins with M, 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 and your phone number ends with 010. And this lady will be like, oh, yeah, 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 go deeper, go deeper for what? <laughs> if I know the color of your dress, what is going to change in your life? If I know your phone number, what has that to do with your eternity? You go home, you are still the same person. But people are flocking like hotcakes to them. Oh, he's a powerful. Can you imagine? He even, he even described the underwear color that I put on. <laughs> My goodness, this is a man of God. No, the Bible says these are the teachings of demons. I was in Harare just a couple of months ago. There was a conference I was invited to speak there. And I was, during tea time, I was talking to my fellow pastor who is from Botswana. And as we were talking about the current affairs of the church, which most, more, more, I mean, it's more like talking about the man-centered preaching. And then we said, what is going on within our continent that people are preaching things that are not in the Bible? And he says, brother, you never trust it. And he said, tell me, what do you mean? He says, did you know that these, some of the prophets, they have got special rooms in their churches? And in these rooms, it's only the prophet and whosoever the client is coming to seeking for counseling. Only pastor and one woman. And when this happens, and he said, when this happened, he said, you can't believe it. There was one woman, she was told, I'm not exaggerating brothers. These things are happening, and probably they're happening in Gul as well. And he says, the pastor in the church in that counseling room, he tells this woman, he says, uh, you know what, the Lord is telling me that you need to undress yourself. We need to pray for your underwear for you to go back and start producing babies. Where in the Bible have you seen Jesus touching the private parts of women as a way of helping them. Where? And these are what Paul says, some of these teachings are the teachings of who? Of demons. It's not from the scripture. You will not get it from scripture. And there are these young pastors that are just coming up. They want to be driving Mercedes Benz. So they go to these prophets, and some have even said, I just want to go to Nigeria. Papa, Oga, pray for me, lay hands on me. <laughs> he wants somebody when he comes here, and they should even have bodyguards. Where in the scripture did you see Jesus having bodyguards? And the foolish part of it, they have got these stickers. They would say, buy just this sticker, my ma. This sticker is going to help you. And there are those who say, oh, mama, 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 this is anointing water. This is not anointing water, by the way. Thank you so much, sister. But these men of God will say, this water is from Nigeria. Buy this. Only if you can take this water before you, you go to bed, you do like do 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 and the people believe into that. <laughs> Brothers, people believe that. They believe like if only I could have water. Or even if I had come from Malawi and I said, you know what? I'm bringing water from Malawi. And Brother Jimmy put it on TVs and radio stations. Tell people. <laughs> <laughs> the holy water from Malawi is coming. <laughs> My brother, this place would be small. <laughs> we could have more pastors, bishop, apostles, a bishop, whatever title that you could talk of. It's not the water that saves human beings. It is the word of God. So Paul comes back and he says, they have departed from the faith. And because they have departed from the faith, now they are devoting themselves to deceitful spirits 
and teachings of demons. Through the insincerity of their lies was conscious as sued. And he gave example, he says, of course they were told, do not eat this, do not get married. I'm like, how could somebody tell me not to get married? <laughs> as a way for me to be holy. Isn't marriage created by God? My, my, my fellow brothers, isn't marriage created by God? I mean, if I come from Malawi and I say, don't eat matoki, would you believe me? You have been eating matoki all these times. You eat plantains. And these people that would say, do not eat this particular food. Do not eat that particular food. Food will never make somebody to be saved. But these people is what they were teaching. He says they are being deceived. And they are devoting themselves into lies. We see this from time to time. Ours may be different from what probably Paul was writing to young Timothy. Ours is what I've just talked about. They'll be talking about you're going to buy. I see, I see Mercedes Benz. Uh, uh, Brother Jimmy, I see you in Mercedes Benz. Mercedes Benz, the metallic one. No, 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 oh, the white one, the white one. And then Brother Jim is like, yeah, what for? <laughs> Jesus did not come so that we should be driving Mercedes Benz. He came that we may be liberated from the bondage of sin and be united back with God the Father. <laughs> but when men have depart from the truth, all they teach, is about material, is about how big they're gonna be, is about how beautiful things will come from them. It's about all about every things. Paul says, Young Timothy, be careful. These men have departed away from the faith. Their teachings, their beliefs is all man centered. And they all boast about how great they are, what sort of miracles they have done. Oh, I was in Botswana, I did this. I was in Uganda, I did this. So even when they walk, they don't just walk like the way some of us have come here. They were supposed to be some great men here with their guns like this. You never see Jesus doing that. But that's what we see today. Man-centered messages is dangerous because it does not bring the fruit as desired by God through the Spirit of God. Friends, we are here on this conference to be rejuvenated, to be warned, never be deceived to take that path. Do not get envy sometimes when another pastor in your community, it looks like his ministry is flourishing because of the lies that he has put into it. Better for you to have few flocks, but be faithful day and night, praying for them, preaching the gospel. We are not in competition, friends. We are not in competition like how many people you have in your church. It all goes as God desires. Some of us, our churches will never get to 300 or 500. And it's okay if that's what God wills is. And some of us, no matter how hard we may be, will never have our own car. And it's okay to be a minister without a car, but be faithful to the preaching of God's word. It's okay. Man-centered preaching is dangerous, friends. It pushes people away from God. It, 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 it does not bring them closer to Christ. It pushes them further and further away from God. Because it's from demons. It's from Satan himself. As I'm concluding, having looked at what a man-centered preaching looks like, a man-centered message, it all focuses on man and not God who has done great things for him. We also want to look at uh, the last part, which is a good part. Amen? Amen? Amen. 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 Hey, tend to your neighbor to say, now it's about a good part. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Let's read together on verse number A6. It says, 
If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of faith and of good doctrine. Let's, let's stop there. And of a good doctrine. Come on. And of a good doctrine. A Christ-centered message of preaching, it is a message that has got a sound doctrine. My brother yesterday, he talked about it. He, 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 he tackled a little bit part of it. Preaching without preaching the sound doctrine is a bad preaching. No matter how many people clap hands for you, no matter how people say you're great, Paul says, I expect you, young man, to train yourself in the word of faith. In other words, he says, as a pastor, as a shepherd of God's flock, I want you to do all your ministry from the word of God. From the counsel of God's word, from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. Take time, study God's word. Search and pray and seek the intended meaning. Why did God write these things? What is it that God is teaching from this passage? Not what you as a pastor you want. There is that temptation sometimes when it comes to preaching. You want to preach what you want. Because you know what people want to hear. It is in the same book that Paul is warning young Timothy says, in the last days, people would depart from the faith and they'll be willing to hear what their ears are issuing to hear. But he says, but for you, young man, preach the word. In and out of season, preach the word. Let people know what God has done on his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Let people know that they themselves, no matter how people may say they are good, they will never save themselves. It's not about how much money they give to church. It's about having faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And that's our task as men of God. Showing the people. Feeding the sheep. You know, when, when Jesus was talking to John, in the book of John, the last part of chapter, where it was, I think it was Peter, Peter it was said, feed the sheep. And he said, yes, Lord. And Jesus came back to him, he said, feed my sheep. On the third time, the Bible says, Peter started crying. He understood it is a massive task. We have been called to feed the sheep of God with not what they want to hear, neither what we want them to hear, but what God wants them to hear. That's our task. It says, verse number seven. It says, have nothing to do with irrelevant serial myth. Rather, train yourselves for godliness. For while body training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promises for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people. What do you preach? Do you help people to see that Christ is their only hope and not you, not me, not so-called great prophet or whatever? Do we preach that message? Do we draw people to Christ who died for them on the cross, the great shepherd? When we are unpacking the Bible, do we see Christ at work in those passages? Are we calling people to God or are we calling people to ourselves? I have seen there's this one thing that these people like, the people who depart away from the faith. All they want 
is the people to depend on them and not to depend on God. If you read this, this verse, it says, show them the living God who is the savior of all people. Eh? Because we have our hope set on the living God. Verse number nine, I mean verse number 10. Let me read it or go. It says, for this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on whom? The living God, who is the savior of all people, especially of those who what? Who believe. Gospel centrality is when one preaches pointing people to Christ. Helping people to understand that uh, we study God's word so that we can be built up in that which God has already done on the cross. We don't need to do anything to make us God to love us more. Nothing. It is in the book of Isaiah, it says that even the good work done by man is like fifth rags before God. We are who we are by the grace of God. We become the children of God because of the grace of God. We are accepted because of what Christ has done on the cross. We are adopted in his family, not because we are good, not because of anything good that we have done. Our living hope is a built in nothing but on Christ and Christ alone. That's our task. Let's draw people to Christ, not to us. We'll never save men, neither will save ourselves. There is only one Savior whose name is Jesus. He goes on to say on verse number 11, Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but say to the believer as an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Watch this on verse number 13. Until I come, devote yourself to what? To the public reading of scripture. Exhorting and teaching. Gospel centrality is about teaching what God has said in his word. I have seen some men of God who comes on the pulpit. They just carry the Bible. They don't even open the Bible. They start preaching, and actually they can preach even to two hours and 39 seconds without even quoting any scripture from the Bible. Paul, he says, no, young man, I want you to be different. I want you to be devo devote yourself in public speaking, reading the scripture, telling people, in other words, unpacking the truth of God to people. That should be your business. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, did you hear that? <laughs> and it's a lot of work to do that. Some people think that preaching is an easy work. It is not. The only beauty of it, we do not do it by our own strength. We do it by the strength, by the grace of God who works in us. But it requires you and I to do hard work. To study God's word. As a minister, as a shepherd of God's flock, you don't just walk up on Sunday. You have been busy doing other things from Monday to Saturday, just doing nothing. And the Sunday you walk up and you be like, oh my gosh, oh, ro, 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 ba, 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 ba. So you come to and then you say, okay, what are we going to look today? Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. So because you haven't studied God's word, you have nothing to teach people. You can't even read scripture to people. And then you just say, today we are having a time for testimonies. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And you talk, you go that side, you go that side. And people, you confuse even your own people. He says, as a shepherd of God's flock. By the way, you need to remind me time. I'm from Malawi. I need more time. So you need to remind me. <laughs> Amen. I'm not from United States. I'm from Malawi. I need time. I'm an African. So I, I mean, it would be good if you give me a son and not be bothered at all. Paul says, young man, devote yourself in reading of scripture in public. 
We do not come to church to be entertainers of people. Uh -uh. Do you know that these days it's more or less like preaching is entertainment? If, it, if, if that doesn't happen in Guru, thank God. But it, it happens elsewhere in Africa. It has become like an entertainment. Because people want to preach things which you, the hearers want to hear. We are messengers. Our job is to deliver that message sent by our master king Jesus. Amen. I remember back in those days when we had dictators in Africa, including in all my country. We had Dr. Kamuzu Banda. Growing up as a young child, we were told, you would be in the village and they would say, don't dare to name the name of Kamuzu anyhow. You'll be punished. And we could believe that. And if Kamuzu Banda sent someone to say, I'm sending you from Gulu to go to Kampala and deliver this as a minister, and if you go there and you say something contrary to what Kamuzu has said, you'll be in trouble. Yeah. And your kids will be in trouble. And the kids of their kids will be also what? In trouble. There was that need for a messenger to be faithful to take the message and to deliver it, as Kamuzu has said. The one that I'm talking about is greater than all other men of this world. It is God, the living God. So when we stand here, we become the mouthpiece of God. And our job and our duty is not to say things that will make people love us or clap hands for us for that matter. Our job is to tell them exactly what God has said in his word. Could somebody say amen, please? Amen. That's our task. So when Paul says, young man, devote yourself in public reading scripture, devote yourself teaching God's word, Teaching the doctrines of God, not what people want to hear. It will never save them. It is the sound doctrine which will save them and will save us as messengers as well. As I'm concluding, on verse number 14, do not neglect the gift you have which was given to you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Let me make a pause here. I want to believe that all of us here, we are pastors. We are servants of God. And God has called us. We have that great ministry, which is not our ministry. It's God's ministry. How are you doing with God's ministry? How are you handling God's word? Take it very seriously and do not let anybody despise you. It could be because of your, young, your, your, your youthful age. It could be because <clears throat> you don't have even the suit, the clothing, that sometimes people would want a, a pastor to need to look to be in this way. Says God is calling us to be faithful teaching the word of God. Practice these things, immerse yourself in them. Did you underscore that word immerse? In other words, devote yourself into it. Take your time studying God's word, praying before you go on the pulpit to preach to people. You don't just wake up and then you say, this is what I'm going to preach. You don't, there, there, there are even some people who just open the Bible and they say wherever the finger will go there and, and uh, boom. So today we are looking at John 3, 16. Hallelujah. For God so loved the world. They, they, they read about first John, I mean John chapter 3, but they'll start preaching about giving. And what is the relationship between these two things? It's because he never took time to immerse himself in God's word. Take time, friends, study God's word, read and pray fully, praying that the Holy Spirit will be with you, will help you to become the mouthpiece of God. Be that servant whom, when you are done, you can be like Paul said, I have fought 
a good fight. Because he took care of God's sheep. And Paul says, also he says, he says, I'm clean. I did not withhold God's counsel from you. I have preached, I've taught you. If you have chosen to go other way, it's not because I've failed my job or my task. I have done my part. Would you say that? Or oh, probably you feel like, hmm, I'm glad I'm here. I need to go back home and change the way I'm doing ministry. I need to spend more time in prayer. I need to spend more time in studying God's word. This other day, my daughter was asking you, I was in my study room, and he says, study, what are you doing? You, you spend so much in here, in your office here. What are you doing? I said, my daughter, this is my office. This is where I talk to the one who sends me to the people you see on Sunday. He says, okay, daddy, I'll pray for you, daddy. <laughs> Have a place in your home where as a servant of God, you can immerse yourself in God's word. Let the word speak to you before it speaks to the people that are going to speak yes, to you. Yes, Let the word of God challenge you before you take it to the people whom you are going to preach. We do not just preach because we have got nothing to do. If that is the case, it's better even today to say, you know what, friends, pray for me. I'm going back to be a border border driver. <laughs> it's okay. To be a minister of God's word is a task. It's hard work. My prayer for you and my prayer even for myself is God should help us to be disciplined, to study his word, to understand the intended meaning of the author, to draw principles from that word, and to make the application to the people that God is calling us to. Preaching gospel centrality is not just this embedding of information. It's calling people to Christ, the one who died for them. It's calling people to change their behaviors in line of God's word. It's, it's calling people to be admonished by God's word. It's making people not just love you as a pastor, as a leader, but that they can be in love with their master who died for them. Amen. Amen. The last word, it says, keep close watch on yourself and on the teaching persists in this. For by so doing, you save both yourselves and your hearers. Gospel centrality is about Jesus, drawing people to Christ. Gospel centrality is showing people what God has done through his son, Jesus Christ. And he alone is their great shepherd, the savior who can save them and who can also save us. How is your preaching ministry? Are you preaching things just to make people to love you, to clap hands for you? Is your ministry centered on uh, making people to like you as a pastor? Or is your ministry centered on the things that you just want people to give more financially? to the work of God? Or will you be driven as Paul is encouraging young Timothy? Immerse yourself in the sound doctrine. Make yourself busy reading scripture in public and packing God's truth to people. Showing people what God has done that is not by themselves, but it is by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And he calls us again, you can't just talk about gospel centrality without talking about the Christ character in you as a messenger. My brother Ronald, he tackled a little bit about that yesterday. Gospel centrality works hand in hand with your godly character. That's why he says, wash yourself how you walk. Look at your conduct. 
Do you walk in humility? Do you seek to be Christ-like? Beginning from our marriages, a workplace, maybe in business places. It says, watch how you walk. You could have a beautiful message on one hand, but if your life pattern is not compatible with God's word, it's going to be hard for people to believe what you say. Lead by example. Be that shepherd who can say, follow me as I follow Christ. If we do that, our churches, there will be transformation. Marriages will be transformed. Young men and young women will be transformed. Our countries and our politics will be transformed. If we do not do that, if Christ is not the center of our messages, brothers, nothing is going to change. Africa will remain the same. It's on you. It's on me. Preach the word. Paul says, in and out of season, preach the word. Even when the church down on your town there, even if your neighbor does not preach the word, preach the word, be faithful. And wait and see what the Lord is going to do. May God bless us all as we think and reflect on these things. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we want to thank you that through your man servant Paul, you spoke to young Timothy to see by himself the difference between man-centered message and the Christ-centered message. You want him. That man-centered message delivers its power from the demons and the teaching departs away from the faith. And I want to pray for my brothers and my sisters here today present. That as you have called us in different churches and denominations, that we can be faithful in preaching nothing but the gospel, pure gospel. That we will seek to draw people to yourself, Lord, the living hope, the only savior we have. That even when people laugh at us because all we do is preach the word without making all statements that to make them to love us, that God, we will seek to be faithful to the end. I pray for your church in Gulu. Equip these men, Lord. Equip them and remind them. As Paul is lamenting to Timothy, he says, do not allow anybody to despise you. Immerse yourself. May that be the spirit for all of us here today present. That we will saturate ourselves in your word. And your word will be part of our lives day by day to the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.